but thank you for the, for that introduction. Um, just after today, I'm going to be talking about inflation, conflict, and monetary policy. And so it's not a specific paper per se. Um, it's just sort of the things that I've been doing for the past uh, couple of years that has focused on monetary policy. Um, and what I want to do is first talk about current inflation uh, because it's such a hot topic right now. And then I segue into sort of a central bank response to inflation, segue from that into the post Keynesian view on monetary policy. And to no one's surprise, I think uh, my talk will be highly um, critical. And so I've written papers kind of, uh, with the title, The General Ineffectiveness of Monetary Policy. Uh, the deconstruction of monetary policy and papers of that nature. So I'm very critical of monetary policy done from the perspective of the mainstream. And so the last part, like I said, is going to be an exploration of what monetary policy is and what does that mean for policy to begin with. Before I get that, I just want to... I don't know how to change slides. Oh. Uh, wh which one do I do? Oh, just the little the bottom yeah, one. Right. So just a couple of things. Um, last year, I created a a um, a series of books, uh, a book series um, with Elgar called the Elgar series on central bank and monetary policy. And so far we've got about eight books out with another eight or nine in the coming year. Um, and the purpose of those books is to push the discussion of monetary policy to, to another level. And uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, that this book has come out on cryptocurrencies and e-money. Um, income distribution is coming out this month. Environment has just come out. Social responsibility and democracy. So what's the role of an un unelected uh, bureaucracy and central bank? Uh, it, how consistent is it with uh, principles of democracy and the future of central bank? And this one is coming out later this year. It's on gender. So there's very little on the issue of monetary policy and gender. This is the first attempt at a book with, I think there's 10 chapters. Um, so uh, to look at how monetary policy affects gender. And one of the overriding themes throughout this book series is on uh, inequality, monetary policy from the perspective of inequality and how it affects gender um, and stability. These are just two books that have uh, now come out. The one on the left is the Encyclopedia of Post Kings and Economics. So that had quite a lot of uh, contributors and just cut came out this week. And the a book, and it's a book uh, on history of thought. Okay, I think, oh yeah, and I do want to promote the blog. I created a blog in June called the Monetary Blog. Um, it's doing quite well. And it's the only blog in the world dedicated to monetary policy from a critical perspective. So every week we've got a blog and Jamie Galbraith wrote a couple of entries. And, and we're starting now a monetary blog for undergraduates, which is going to be about 25 uh, blog, each about a thousand words written for undergraduate students. What's a central bank? What does a central bank do? What's, so uh, what's endogenous money? What's, Okay. If you want to go on, on Twitter, you can follow us there. And I do want to um, dedicate this talk to a number of people that we've lost. Um, Alain Parguez, we've lost six, seven months ago, but the other four we lost in the last week, in the last 10 days. Vicky Cheek, which was a tower, towering person in post-Keynesian economics. Uh, James Crotty and her dentist at UMass, 
uh, and Barclay Wasser. Um, so, and I could have added more names to it. We've lo we're losing too many people. And finally, um, I'm an unabashed post-Keynesian. So I thought it's better to put a picture of Maynard, uh, my little dog, <laughs> uh, that I've named for some reason after some uh, obscure, economist. obscure economist. And speaking of Keynes, uh, this is a quote that I really like. It was a BBC interview in 1942 where Keynes says, anything we can actually do, we can afford. In the long run, almost anything is possible. We can do almost anything we like, given time. In good time, we can do it all, but we must work to a long time. Uh, so I think this is, you know, it's not a quote that's very well known, uh, but I think it's essential to the kind of vision of economics that that I certainly profess to. Okay. Um, so it's not a specific paper. It's sort of, you know, I want to tell a story, a grand story about monetary policy and inflation. And I was just uh, saying last night, this is how I learn economics, and this is how I teach economics. It's about storytelling. What's the story that you're trying to tell? And that's how I learned my mathematics. That's how I learned my econometrics. Uh, is that the story comes first, the math comes second, and the econometrics come second. And I think that's a very um, different way of doing economics than the mainstream, which are overly focused with techniques and all of that. Okay, so um, let me begin with inflation. It's been dormant for the past uh, three decades or so, um, you know, starting, it starts to come down in 1982, 83, um, and it remains relatively stable uh, trend-wise for the past at least 30 years from about 1990. And it's just recently that it resurfaced as a huge problem. And with that, the response from central banks. And the response from central banks has been predictable. You raise interest rates, and you raise interest rates until inflation comes down. Jerome Powell in the United States have said this. He was asked, when are you going to start, you know, stop, uh, you know, when, when are you going to stop raising interest rates? He says, when inflation comes back to target, which is about 2%. I have something to say about that. But certainly uh, inflation has, has come back, but we need to understand where that, what that inflation is, or where that inflation comes from. Because what I want to show is that current monetary thinking applies really to one type of inflation, which is demand for inflation. And in fact, the entire model of central banking is based around this notion that prices react to increases in interest rates. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of that with the model and everything. And what I want to show is that once we're done with the critique and the deconstruction, there's nothing left from the main, the re, there's nothing left from the mainstream perspective to deal with inflation. Um, and so the question becomes, then, you know, what's inflation? How, you know, how do, where does it come from? And how do we do it? Uh, James Tobin in 1974 in the New York Times uh, talks about the hysteria around inflation. He says, in hysteria about inflation may lead to policies that keep economic progress well below its potential. And this is what's happening. And, you know, at the very end, I'll become a lot more radical about my views. Uh, but right now, you know, let's, let's uh, remain uh, uh, academic about it. Okay, so that's inflation. So three types of inflation, uh, demand pull inflation, uh, cost, push, cost push inflation, and then conflict inflation. How many here have heard of these different types of inflation? Uh, how many have heard about conflict inflation? 
Yeah, a lot less. Okay. For me, inflation is always and everywhere a conflict phenomenon. Okay, we'll get to that later. Demand inflation. This is a traditional what, what we teach in principles courses, for example. Uh, it's mostly associated with the mainstream. Uh, a couple of expressions, too much money chasing too few goods, always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, uh, a result of irresponsible government uh, deficit spending, uh, excess demand phenomena. So basically we buy too much goods, bids up the prices of goods, and you've got inflation. Um, and this is the dominant view of inflation from the mainstream perspective. And we see that in the rhetoric uh, from central banks today, although there's a little bit of conflict, and I'll get to that in a second. But for heterodox uh, economists, uh, this is a misplaced argument. Most inflation is not demand driven. Uh, for example, Francis Cripps, excess demand provides at most only a minor component of comprehensive explanation. Um, so the idea that inflation is deterred by excess demand, by excess government spending, large deficits, um, and the discussion is going on right now in the United States as they hit the debt ceiling. A lot of people are saying, oh, we can't spend because you know we're in a high inflation era, uh, era already. It's going to lead to even a higher inflation. Um, so how important is demand inflation nonetheless in the post-pandemic era? So there has been some papers, even from some uh, critical heterodox, who have said that in a post-pandemic era, inflation is, uh, there, there's considerable demand inflation um, from pent-up savings, from uh, uh, luxury spending from the 1%, uh, which is keeping inflation up. So I will look at that towards the end as well. The other type of inflation is the cost push inflation, which is associated a lot with the heterodox position, although some people in the mainstream certainly recognizes um, cost push in, uh, inflation. This tradition, uh, in the post Keynesian tradition goes back to people like Sidney Weintraub, for example. Um, and essentially, you know, as the, you know, uh, or even some aspects of Kielecki where prices are set according to a markup and the markup de depends on uh, monopoly power and the cost of production or wages, cost of raw materials. And so if, uh, for example, the, the um, costs go up, then firms, if they've got the proper mo monopoly power, can pass these uh, costs uh, to consumers through higher prices. So in this perspective, cost push would be sort of the dominant view uh, of inflation in sort of this manufacturing oligopolistic you know, world. Um, Kalecki talks also about flex prices, which is agricultural, for example. Um, but the predominant source of inflation here would be uh, cost. And finally, and also, you know, I certainly, my views are certainly in agreement with this, but I don't like the dichotomy between demand pull and cost push. I think it's too simple because I think it masks the, the real source of, of, of inflation, which for me is constant, it is conflict. Um, so conflict inflation is the idea that inflation is the result between antagonistic uh, macro groups, whether you have workers on one side and firms on the other. And the traditional way of, of sort of modeling these in sort of, you know, Kalecki models would be that you have a price equations from firms with a target um, <clears throat> share of wages or real wage for the from the perspective of firms, and then you have a, a wage equation from the perspective of labor that target their own sort of uh, real wage. And so you have this com competition or competing or conflictual views about wh what firms think should be uh, uh, the real wage and what 
labor wage, union wage, and that sets up the economy. And if unions are powerful, they can succeed in getting um, their actual wage close to their target wage. And subsequently, if firms are powerful enough, they can succeed in passing those costs on to consumers. So <clears throat> it is certainly a cost push, but you see the notion of conflict there. Now, I think all inflation is conflictual. But what I don't like about this model is that it puts the blame for inflation with labor. Uh, the idea that labor are demanding higher wages. And so labor is to uh, blame for inflation. Whereas I think that the initial conflict usually begins with firms. Um, and labor is just trying to catch up in some sort of second round effects. Um, and I'll get to that in just a second. But the debate on conflict and inflation you erupted on Twitter uh, because Olivier Blanchard in December, late December, up posted this. And he talks about you know, inflation being driven by uh, conflict over distribution of uh, shares of income between workers profits. And uh, that led to a huge, huge debate on Twitter in which I participated. And um, now, to be fair, Olivier has been talking about this for many years. Uh, and uh, for 80, 86, I think. But he's been talking about it for, for, for decades. Um, but for him, the initial, uh, uh, the initial rise in prices can come from demand, deficits, which push up, pushes up prices and then workers join in in the second round of demand of higher wages. So for him, demand pull is not necessarily inconsistent with, uh, with conflict inflation. But again, the conflict for him arises because workers want to catch up. So the source of the conflict is the workers here. Um, and from a heterodox perspective, uh, the original, certainly the classic art, uh, article about Rowland's uh, paper in the Cambridge Journal in 1977, where he says conflict is endemic in the capitalist system, concerns all aspects of economic life. I'm not a huge fan of that paper because I think there's a lot of sort of traditional ideas in that paper, but it was certainly a, a, a strong, you know, innovative paper that brought conflict uh, uh, to the core. And so, um, always looking for publications as editor of a rope. Um, I decided now to do a symposium and uh, I've asked Bob Rothorn to update his paper from you know, five decades later almost. And Jamie Galbraith and uh, a few other people will have papers on conflict inflation. Now, concerning the Blanchard debate on Twitter, um, I wrote a reply with Mark Lavoie to Blanchard, Jamie Galbraith, Galbraith wrote a reply in the blog and my paper with Mark Lavoie was in the blog as well. So if you want to check out, you know, Jamie's response was just so classic Galbraithian uh, wit. Uh, it's really quite nice to, uh, to read. But what I want to argue right now is that for me, the idea of laying blame at the feet of workers is I think wrong. Um, workers may, the only thing workers do in my opinion is trying to catch up all the time. Um, the initial conflict for me, especially in a globalized or in a financialized world is with firms who are looking to protect their share of income or increase their share of income to satisfy shareholders. 
So this whole literature on financialization or a shareholder valuation theories, I think applies here. Uh, firms are always looking to increase their share of profits uh, or when there is an increase in cost, what many economists will call shock. One of the first things, and we see it now in the pandemic, one of the first things that firms do is to increase profits. Why can't we see the uh, increased prices? Why can't we see that as conflict? The decision, the exogenous decision to raise prices is conflict. And firms do it all the time, but we don't talk about that as conflict. We talk about that as well, it's just a shock. But it's a, it's a conflictual position from the position perspective of firms, because you know that when you increase prices, uh, real wages will come down. And of course, and thank God, workers will respond and say, no, no, we want to have, you know, higher wages. So on the one hand, when firms decide to raise prices to protect their share of profits, that's fine. But as soon as workers decide to do the same, we blame them for the production. And we know this because central banks have, um, have, have warned workers. Our own governor in Canada has warned workers not to, not to demand higher wages. The governor of the Bank of England did the same thing, right? Because for them, the conflict begins with the workers' response. And Jerome Powell, he says, there's going to be a lot of pain, right? And so, you know, in other words, if you raise your, if you demand higher wages, there'll be more inflation, it will raise interest rates. And you're going to suffer. So the message from the central banks to workers is shut up. Just accept your lower real wage and everyone will be happy. Okay. Um, so the current monetary policy is built on the notion that the, uh, inflation is, is majorly uh, demand driven. And the evidence, you know, is all over the place. I've seen reports that says that demand inflation is 18% of total inflation. And I've seen papers published by the Fed saying it's 60, 65% of total inflation. And that certainly buys into the central bank argument, because if you raise interest rates, you lower consumption and you pull over all of that average demand stuff through, and then through Phillips curve, um, you you know raise unemployment, you lower inflation, and so um, and this has been the central bank response: we raise interest rates to quell demand that will bring inflation. So this is what Galbraith said about the hysteria: it's going to lead to policies that's going to make things worse. And I think that this is what's happening. Okay. So we have to have a better understanding of where current inflation comes from, and then a better way of addressing how do we deal with it. Now, for the record, yes, inflation is horrible on individuals. Grocery bills are out of this world. When I go and buy chicken that I used to pay $9, it's now $27. Uh, and we all have stories like that. And it's difficult to make ends meet. Um, I understand that. But from a macroeconomic perspective, let's be clear that inflation doesn't lead to distortions until it reaches the 2025-30%. And there's some a lot of lots of empirical uh, work that comes and um, support this idea. So you know. Uh, the idea that inflation of six, seven percent um, doesn't really have a macroeconomic impacts as much, you know, as much as the mainstream tells us to do. And it's funny, I was uh, telling this to my principal's class last week, and most of the students in French, most of the students are from Africa, and they were going, inflation back home is 50 percent. And you're complaining about 6%. And um, yeah, but on an individual basis, I realized that, yes, you, 
it makes life a little bit more difficult. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Now, if you haven't uh, checked out their website, go. It's a gold mine of really good research. I think Mark Lee is one. Hi, Mark is on uh, is on here, and he's with the CCPA and. Uh, and, and so, uh, why are you? I can't think. Anyways, sorry, I'm thinking about the PM. But anyway, but David McDonald at the CCPA does excellent work. He just came out with a report this week or Thursday, probably. Maybe yeah, maybe it was earlier this week. On where does your inflation dollar go to? What, where, where does it go? And he's looked at. He's disaggregated these uh, inflation numbers by industry. And you know he's concluded that there are two main sources: uh, oil, and oil has been coming down. The price of oil has been coming down, but also the largest is just uh, profit, uh, profit inflation. And um, yeah, so in in in. Oil was a large uh, uh, contributor to inflation, 26% of total inflation in Canada, 30% in, uh, sorry, 26 in Europe, 30% in Canada. Okay, so when inflation was at uh, 9%, a third is three, you know, we're down to six. And if now it's a little bit more, let's say it's a quarter, we're down from six, we're down to uh, uh, 4%. So, it's a big, uh, the implications of understanding where inflation comes from is important. And of course, you know, Jerome Powell has admitted that raising interest rates won't do anything if inflation are cost driven. And he's right. Um, but corporate profit margins remain the highest uh, ever in recorded history and what we call inflation dollars. Um, and this is a graph about um, oh, yeah. um, no, I'm gonna stop. Unit of real world value added. And this is for the United States. And we see that in 1980 is always sort of a structural break in a lot of things, uh, the Thatcher and Reagan, um, and you can see that starting to increase. And this is also corresponds to uh, financial aid, the beginning of financial aid. Okay. Price of oil is going to come down, and I think this is one of the reasons where why you've seen inflation coming down in the last four or five months. Uh, so this is what I've said that um, the, re the the reports I've seen on demand inflation has ranged from eighteen percent to about sixty percent, um, and some heterodox service storm has argued that. Uh, the demand component, demand driven inflation comes from uh, consumption of the 1%. And I have a, I read a report recently that said um, the purchase of Bentleys has dramatically increased. And so has uh, the private use of jets. Um, and we know that a recent report came out that said the wealth of the one or five percent of Canadian has increased fifty one percent in the last uh, three years. Um, so there's been this tremendous increase in wealth. Um, okay, central bank response. Quite expectedly. Bank of Canada, a number of banks, Fed has raised interest rates, and we went from you know 0.25 to 4. Actually, will we go higher? Um, my bet is 
probably, we probably won't get 0.75 increases, but certainly half a point. Um, I would be surprised if we didn't get all of that. Now, I think there's more, and this is an empirical question, and I haven't looked at it, but I would be prepared to think that the financial distress caused by this on Canadians is more than the price of inflation, than, than the inflation of grocery bills. Well, that's a question. But this has been the most aggressive monetary policy response in the history, uh, certainly in the last 75 years. So uh, interest rates went up much faster than most times. Um, now this is for the US. Uh, I, haven't done, I haven't done this one either, but I didn't look at the Canadian one. But I thought this was very interesting and my students will recognize this. This, this graph, this figure, because I show it in class. I show it in class. Um, perfect. So, like I said, nothing to um, nothing to be too surprised about. Um, and here's again the quote by Tobin, and here's one one by Hajun, who said in Hajun Chang, who says inflation has become a boogeyman used to justify policies that have mainly benefited the holders of financial assets. I wrote a small piece called uh, Inflation Paranoia. Um, absolutely. We're paranoid about inflation. And so from a monetary perspective, or from a political economy perspective of monetary policy, why are central banks reacting so aggressively about inflation? If I remember, I'll tell you what might be at the end. Okay, so what's the general model that's used in, uh, in, in monetary policy? It's this one, the consensus models. And it has a policy component, the Taylor rule, and it's got a theoretical. Equations one and two are theoretical. So this is the transmission mechanism. Equation one is your IS curve, uh, which is you know, essentially, uh, output is affected by interest rates. Equation two is your Phillips curve. And that's the policy. And you, even the most recent, some more recent models, tank, hank, rank models, they do intergenerational, uh, uh, not intergeneration, um, inter. Sorry? Temporal. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, you know, but it, they have this kind of mentality, nevertheless, behind their model. Uh, in another paper, and this is a book that I'm currently writing, um, I'm writing a book which deconstructs the model, and I've identified, I've, I've identified eight elements. Um, it's got two chapters. The first chapter is just the deconstruction of the model. And that's done. And the second chapter is a reconstruction of the model. And it's it's a book called Monetary Policy. And I've identified eight issue, eight elements: inflation targeting, which is core of that model, the IS group, the Phillips group, the existence of a natural rate of interest, the concept of fine-tuning, right? Monetary policy. Does it work? Uh, demand side inflation, central bank independence. This model is based on this. And finally, monetary policy dominance, the idea that only monetary policy can solve inflation. Today, I'm only going to talk about one, two, and three uh, before getting into the post-Keynesian stuff. Uh, and there's this quote by Hicks, Gamber, and Shen, which I really like. They said, although the Fed may respond modestly or not at all to its policy objectives for extended periods of time, which was the case. We had low inflate interest rates for years. Uh, this pattern of behavior may be interrupted by peers when the Fed responds more aggressively. And this is what's going on now. So all of the all of the monetary reflexes of central banks have come out. You raise interest rates right away. 
and you know you front load your policy so you discourage your workers your labor force from demanding higher wages etc okay so this is exactly what's been happening since the financial crisis it was dormant but now it's coming back with a vengeance um talk about that but interestingly enough um we went from a monetary target to an interest rate target system, largely because central banks finally realized that they don't control the money supply. Um, and that the best way of, is, is controlling the instrument, the rate of interest. But the, the target, inflation, has never really changed. We went from a situation where inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon to a situation where inflation is always and everywhere a monetary policy phenomenon. So, you know, Lavoie calls this uh, old wine in the bottle, um, but the mentality of central banks hasn't changed much. Um, so the central question is whether this transmission mechanism do changes in interest rates filter through your goods market, your labor market, to deliver your inflation target. But there's this quote by Philip Arrestes and Malcolm Sawyer. It is a long and uncertain chain of events from adjustment in interest rate con controlled by the central bank to a desired change in the rate of inflation. Sort of echoes what Keynes said about seven slips between the cut and the lift. So the question is, does mainstream monetary thinking work? I want to show that it doesn't work in theory. Okay. Um, first, let's talk about the target of 2%. And that's important. If the, if, if the target was 4%, let's say, and if oil accounts for 25% of total inflation, well, we'd be, we'd be at 4% now. We'd be on target. So the choice of that target is important. Now, I... The first central bank to inflation target was New Zealand in 1990, and I went back and I read a lot of research uh, to prior years to figure out where does this 2% come from? Because 2% is now accepted worldwide. And I've looked at, you know, where's a, where's a, where is there an explanation? Where is there a justification of that 2%? And I found nothing. I found one document that suggested maybe that 2% comes from references to the fiscal rule in Maastricht, uh, uh, but nothing more. But then Ben Friedman wrote uh, very recently, and this was in a best uh, shriek in honor of Victor Constancio. He writes, there is this arbitrariness, right? Arbitrary surrounding the current 2% target in, ret in ret retrospect, the paucity, the lack of, the zero, uh, the lack, the paucity of serious empirical research underlying the identification of 2% norm, now quite some time back in the, is a professional embarrassment. I love this quote. Uh, it is an embarrassment. And there's nothing that has justified. Now, papers have come out subsequently saying, you know, a low, Inflation is better than high, stable, low inflation, et cetera, et cetera. So, but how did we get, how did we adopt that 2%? And there's really nothing. A friend of mine looked at um, research in Australia, and he's found the exact same conclusion that there's really nothing to justify 2%. There's a reporter who wrote a recent piece about a year ago, and he said that he interviewed the governor of the central bank at that time. He asked him, where does the 2% come from? And he, their former governor said, you know, I was asked a question on the spot, and I just invented it. Okay. Emmanuel Carré is a French economist, post Keynesian economist. Right, economic theories have played a limited role in the creation of inflation. Yeah. So consistent with what uh, Ben Friedman is saying. 
none of that is important in the sense that if IT is successful, who cares? So the question is, is IT successful? Well, the first country to adopt it was New Zealand, 1990, Canada, 1991. But if you look at inflation, Inflation has been coming down before the adoption of IT. So the idea that the adoption of IT led to the fall in inflation in the 80s, it, you can't attribute it to IT. But can IT explain why inflation remained, you know, more or less on target for 30 years? And I'll have something to say about that at the very end. Because I think that what it comes down to is that central monetary policy has become a policy of fear. If you raise your wages, if you demand higher wages, and as a result, inflation comes up, goes up, we will increase interest rate, we will create unemployment. And this is a consistent message. And so, yeah, the central bank is using the idea of raising interest rates as a policy of fear against labor. Um, and there's no clear empirical evidence that IT countries outperform non-IT countries. Yeah. Uh, it could be uh, that I've seen in, in the literature, uh, oh, well, non-IT countries are really doing IT. Yeah, so that explains why they've got the same performance. And I've heard, I've seen other uh, re uh, research that just says, it's just luck. We've been lucky. And others who said it's the China effect and China exports cheap iron. <laughs> um, okay, then let's go to the IS. You're all familiar with this curve. The idea is that uh, consumption and investment are interest sensitive. And from the mainstream perspective, you need this curve to be well behaved. And you need this curve to be fairly elastic. You want those degrees of freedom when you raise interest rates, it's got to have that substantial effect on output. If this IS curve is inelastic, you're going to have to increase interest rates a lot considerably more to have a little, right? Okay, so you need an elasticity uh, that's fairly substantial. Um, and of course, going back to the 70s is exactly what Paul was saying. The more sensitive the response, the more potent is monetary, right? The effectiveness of monetary policy depends on the elasticity of the IS curve. Well, there's been a lot of research on that. Um, this is one from Barry Sinem and Stephen Frazari and a co-writer of mine, Mark Setterfield, all well known to many people here. And they said, um, there's no empirical evidence to show that this is the case. Um, some authors have generalized a link to include business investments, but a robust interest elasticity of investment has also been difficult to demonstrate empirically. Um, so, you know, to post Keynesian like myself, investment depends on expectations of growth of aggregate demand in the future, not on interest rate sensitivity. So not surprised, but they've done some empirical work. And if you don't want to believe some wacko heterodox people, well, let's go and quote uh, two people from the Federal Reserve. 2021, they said, a large body, right? A large body, not a small, a large body of empirical, not just theoretical, empirical research offers mixed evidence at best for substantial interest rate effects on investment. Our research find that most firms claim their investment plans to be quite insensitive to decreases in interest rates and only somewhat more responsive to interest rates. So the whole sort of canonical theory of IS curve collapses. Why are we still teaching that? Anyways, that's a good question. Um, so that collapses. So the first sort of fear, so the, the idea of a, of a 2% target collapses. The idea of a, the first part of the theoretical explanation of that transmission co uh, uh, mechanism collapses. So there's not much left. And I've got literally, li literally 100 
more quote that says that across the ideological line. Now, uh, Matteo de Levy published an excellent empirical paper in my journal on the European case, and he finds exactly the same conclusion. Not a mystery. Krugman calls it a dirty little secret. It has effects through real estate, and maybe that has a bigger impact. But he says it's difficult to find in the data this idea that interest rates affects investment directly. So, you know, I've got lots and lots and lots of uh, evidence and quotes and empirical references. Okay, let's go to the Phillips curve now. This is the second component of uh, the transmission mechanism. And this is not the shape of the Phillips curve. I just couldn't draw it with my computer. Uh, so please forgive me. Uh, but the general idea is that this inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. And unemployment being a proxy for, for output. So in the IS, in the IS curve, if interest rates go up, output comes down. And as a result, inflation goes up, uh, unemployment goes up. And if unemployment goes up, you've got that decrease in inflation. And the whole uh objective of monetary policies to generate a soft landing. Let's bring inflation down to target with minimal impact on that. Great research by uh, David McDonald of the CCPA. Canada has, Bank of Canada has never engineered a soft landing, never. In the, I think it's Josh Biddens in the United States, EPI, who says it happened once in the United States. So the track record of soft landing is non-existent. Okay, so, and you need this Phillips curve to be well-behaved as well. You need it to be, you know, smooth, negative, uh, so, okay. The problem with the Phillips curve is that unless you've been living under a rock, um, it's sort of been discredited. A lot of people now arguing that there's a large sort of flux. This one is done in terms of capacity utilization. So that's why it seems to be positive. But uh, there's a large component, a flat component, where output or uh, capacity utilization is irres irresponsive to changes in interest rates. And so what happens with monetary policy to be effective is that if you want to bring in inflation down, you got to raise interest rates, nothing happens. You got to raise interest rates, nothing happens. So you got to raise the interest rates in order to push your capacity utilization your output to such a degree that finally you have a collapse in inflation. In other words, your economy. And so I've argued that monetary policy is a blunt instrument. If you have a fly on your desk and you want to kill it, you use this big, what do you call it? Sledgehammer. And you go, bam! And you kill your fly, but you kill your table at the same time. And that's the, that's sort of what happens here. You raise so much that you collapse your economy and then finally your price is uh, So central banks must exploit the flat component of your Phillips curve in order to be effective. And that requires multiple increases. And by for the record, the expression fine tuning is sort of a misnomer. When you fine tune something, you bring it up, you bring it down, you bring it up, you bring it down, you bring it up. This is just one directional. So it's not fine tuning. Really, it's not. Um, Uh, I have a million, uh, a million quotes from people uh, across the ideological spectrum. I published, yeah, so all these people are saying uh, that the Phillips curve is essential to monetary policy. It's the backbone of monetary policy. You need that Phillips curve to justify 
<clears throat> a rise in unemployment to lower inflation. You need that. If you don't have a Phillips curve, you don't have monetary policy. And then with the you know, realization that that Phillips curve is flat, there's been a cottage industry of papers trying to reestablish the Phillips curve. Uh, my neighbor is an economist. He says, oh, yeah, the Phillips curve is there. We just haven't quite understood what affects it. Five minutes. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be flexible on my good federal reserve. <laughs> um, and so uh, in 2018, I published a symposium in the review of Keynesian economics to celebrate Milton Friedman's the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's presidential. Uh, and Bob Solo wrote a paper, and if you, you have to read, no one writes like Bob Solo, really. No one writes like that generation, I have to say. The stuff of the mix itself has been getting flatter ever since the 80s, is now quite small. Um, Janet Yellen, Bob Gordon in the same issue. Um, so, you know, there's this sort of general acceptance that the Phillips group has flattened. So it's not these sort of like radical lefties who argue that the Phillips curve is flat. Um, but I've come across a recent literature that says, no, no, it's been, it, it, it wasn't, what, what, what did they say? The Phillips curve didn't disappear, it was just dormant. Because now, of course, we see that it's come back to life. Um, um, it was hibernating, sorry, that's the word that Jerome Powell has used. And of course he's going to say that because you need that Phillips curve to justify your policy. Without the Phillips curve, why the hell are you raising your interest rate? So you need that Phillips curve and you need inflation to be demanded. Just more quotes, more quotes, more quotes. Okay, so at the end of the day, um, there's nothing left of that model. And it brings into question, what then is monetary policy? What then is income? What then is interest rates? And uh, I think that for me, income, uh, monetary policy is about class conflict. It's about income distribution. Uh, it's about income distribution from the perspective of workers versus rentier and firm and rentier. We tend to see interest rates as being a cost of investment, cost of borrowing, but it's also a revenue on assets. And who holds those revenues? Who holds, holds those assets? Uh, and predominantly, the people who hold those assets are white men. And so you could argue that it's not only, you know, I wrote a paper called The Inherent Biases of Monetary Policy, and there's a class bias, but there's also a gender bias in monetary policy. Um, oh, this is what I said. Oh, it was Rolls Royce, not Benkins. Um, so when central bank raises interest rates, there's a winner in there. And the winner of those, the winner is uh, rentiers. Two levels. First, uh, the revenues on their financial assets are going up. Interest rates are bonds, for example. And the other way that they win is that by raising interest rates, if you bring down, if you succeed in bringing down, bringing down inflation, you're protecting the real value of their assets. Okay. And so that's the political economy dimension of why are interest rates insisting on raising interest rates. And we know that with QE, that had a huge distributive impact uh, on, uh, on wealth. And so this is a, a table that I did with Mario Sikareccia in a paper that we published, <clears throat> where we argue that monetary policy can be divided into changes in interest rates and quantitative easing that have wealth effects. And interest rates can be divided into an income channel, which is the direct channel, changes in interest rates impact the functional distribution of income, what John Smith has called the revenge of the rentiers. 
And you also have an indirect channel, which the changes in the rate of interest impact the personal distribution of income via labor markets. So changes in interest rates affects the labor market, unemployment, and the personal distribution of income. And uh, the wealth channel from changes in interest rates affects leads to asset bubbles. Now I want to say that for me, asset bubbles are not generated by low interest rates. For me, asset bubbles are created by a lack of regulation. So yeah, maybe interest rates will lead to asset bubbles, but that's because there's no there's a lack of re proper regulation all around that. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna finish here. Um, and so uh, uh, in 1996, I helped put together this book when I was a graduate student at the New School, uh, Money in Motion, which is a classic book uh, edited by Justin de Blas and, and my supervisor, Edward Nill. And Lavoie has this quote that for me was very important. It then becomes clear that monetary policy should not, not be uh, determined in order to control the level of activity, but rather to find the level of interest rates that would be proper for the economy from the distribution point of view. And I took and um, uh, Mark and Mario have developed this Paznetti index where they measure uh, the real rate of interest over labor productivity. And if you look at the Pazinetti from that perspective, so the real rate of interest, so for example, uh, we've used um, the, in, the interest rate on 10-year bonds deflated for inflation over the growth of labor productivity. And if you look at that <clears throat> from the monetary perspective, um, you see that around 1980, you start seeing this uh, tendency this trend that favors red shear. Okay, the red line is using uh, the growth rates of wages rather than labor productivity. And since wages have lagged behind productivity growth, it leads to an amplified pessimity effect. And so I'm presenting a paper, I'm, I'm organizing a conference with the Bank of Italy on this topic. And I'm presenting a VAR model. I don't know what that is, but my goal <laughs> does. Uh, a fancy kind of metrics and all that, right? And we're looking at Paz the evolution of Pazinetti index and how robust it is. But we've done that for several countries. And we've noticed that in, in all countries around 1980, you, you see this, what precisely what John Smith calls the revenge of the red here. And this is the, re the the perfect example of John's uh, expression. You see this revenge of the rich. And then we've looked at the um, correlation between the Pazinetti index and unemployment. Now, as the Pazinetti index goes up, it's a transfer towards the rentier class, away from labor. And so as it is positive, we should expect a higher unemployment rate. And we find that in France, in Canada, and we've done that for about 15 countries, and we see that. So I'm gonna end there, mister, and I'm gonna say that inflation is rooted in conflict, and the use of monetary policy to fight inflation is rooted in conflict. Uh, there are always winners and losers for monetary policy. But for the past 40 years, or maybe not super financial, well, there was a period, right, when low interest rate, but in major, uh, uh, in general terms, uh, rentiers are on the winning end, and they appear to be so again now. Uh, and in the end, if you have this sort of long trend, uh, then what I argue is monetary policy is an income policy. That's how we should see in, uh, monetary policy, interest rate as an income policy, in this case, in favor of rent years. Um, and uh, like I said, it's a policy of fear. Uh, don't demand higher wages or we will raise interest rates and you will suffer. Uh, Powell says pain is coming. So.
Thank you, Rui Philippe, for a great representation of what the economy and society and a great presentation. Mm -hmm. yeah.